The second step, once you understand the situation you're in, is to know the worst that can happen. This will involve both perhaps just doing research, um, such as the legal information that's available on the Help Me Law um, website, or it may mean speaking to a professional, either a nonprofit credit counseling agency, if you're facing a foreclosure, perhaps a HUD certified counselor, those would be um, free or nearly free services. Um, if you qualify, um, some legal aid providers could provide some basic information. Um, but I would recommend that you start with the websites um, and see if that answers your questions. Essentially, the worst that can happen is that your creditors can use the legal process to collect on the debts. Um, essentially, it means you're going to be sued. Before you're sued, you should receive a demand letter that essentially notifies you who the creditor is and what amount they're claiming and some information on the original creditor if the person that is claiming the debt is not the original creditor. Let's say you had a Chase um, credit card that went into default a few months or a few years ago and, you're, and you get one of these letters. It easily could be from you know, Debt Collectors LLC. It could be just an odd name like Portfolio, Portfolio Recovery is an actual um, collection uh, company or it's not, but it's a company that buys bad debts and then attempts to collect on them. Um, and it, will, it is very possible that it's a company that you've never seen before. Um, but they should notify you in this letter that they own the debt and where the, who the original creditor was and the amount of the debt that they're claiming. It often is useful, and I probably should have mentioned this in the first step, is to pull a credit report. Under current federal law, each American or each resident of the United States is entitled to one free credit report per year from each of the three credit reporting agencies. And just to backtrack a little bit, your credit report is not something maintained by the government. It's essentially there are huge pools of information that are maintained by these three companies, Experian, TransUnion, um, and actually blanking on the third, but there are three large companies. Um, and when their request, when a credit report is requested, such like when you requested or where somewhere where you've applied for credit requests one, they will essentially dip into that massive pool of information and generate a credit report with some identifying characteristics of you as an individual, usually a social security number, sometimes a combination of a name, date of birth, and address. You know, they'll use different identifiers, um, and it's a proprietary information. So we're not exactly sure how the process works, but the general process is that they will grab that information um, to create a report on you as an individual who uses credit. It is important to actually go through these things regularly. It is absolutely miserable. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. They are somewhat confusing. They tend to be very long, relatively easy if you're 18. You know, if you're 40 or in your 40s like I am, you know, it will be 20 pages long, um, indicating a lot of the different accounts that a person that I've had or that a, a debtor has had during their life. Um, if you don't see, if you see something you don't understand, you know, you should be able to go through and say, oh, my first mortgage, the car loan, you know, that Chase account I had. You know, the, the things that are listed should make sense. If you start seeing debts that do not make any sense, you know, the Home Depot card where you've never had the Home Depot card, it's important to know that and to contact the creditors and let them know that there's a mistake on your credit report. And it's beyond the scope of tonight's presentation. Um, but there are some federal law protections that do allow you to dispute items on your credit report. But it's a handy tool, even just to understand the total amounts of debt that are out there and that how you look to potential um, creditors. Getting back to knowing the worst that could happen, the collection process in Maine usually occurs through two different court processes. The first one is small claims, which is a relatively simple and quick and informal process um, for claims less than $6,000. So for many car repo debts, um, credit card debts, medical bills, 
oil company debts, those sorts of debts, you know, are often collected through the small claims process. It begins with a statement of claim that is served on the debtor, usually in Maine by a plain clothes deputy sheriff who is responsible for civilian service. Um, in the part of Maine where I work, you know, it often will be a plain clothes officer driving his or her own car with just a badge. So it's not a police cruiser pulling up in front of the house, but it is service from the sheriff's department. After the statement of claims is served, um, you'll receive a notice of hearing from the court, which is a notice that there will be a hearing on this case on a certain date and time at your local district court. Um, that's really the only notice you're going to receive. All of the actual work in the case occurs on the hearing date. Um, during that hearing date, there'll be a docket call, and then there'll, there'll be a chance for mediation. And if mediation is unsuccessful, then there actually will often be a hearing on that date. Although occasionally in some of the busier courts, they may ask you to come back for a hearing on another date. Um, but the process is relatively simple. Almost all of the parties are, are almost all of the individual debtors and most other parties in small claims are unre unrepresented. The judges are used to dealing with people who are unrepresented. It's an informal process. The rules of evidence do not apply. So it's possible essentially to get up on the stand and tell your story and to ask relatively plain language questions of any witnesses the creditor brings. Although it is possible that the creditor will just rely on records and will not actually bring a witness. It depends on the type of suit. It's very common for a local business to have an employee there who can testify to what happened and if there's a debt. Um, for some national um, creditors, it's very possible they'll rely just on records and not bring an actual uh, human being to testify. Small claims is one process for smaller debts. It's something that many people can handle on their, their own and is a process that's designed that for lawyers not to be necessary. The alternative process um, is just the standard complaint process. We use as a shorthand a pine tree summons and complaint in district court. But it's where you're served a summons and a complaint, again, by a plain clothes deputy sheriff. There are requirements that an answer be filed with the court within a short period of time, 20 days. And there's a term of art to counting some of these days and some of these um, timelines. If you answer, the case will be scheduled with a discovery deadline and other um, deadlines to process the case. It is common for the creditor to file a request for admissions as well as discovery, which are requests from information from you, explaining how to conduct or essentially how to defend a lawsuit is again beyond the scope of this presentation. It is very easy to make mistakes. Um, I, would, I would suggest that if a person was served with a summons and complaint to do everything that they can to get a lawyer involved. You know, sometimes it's just not possible to hire one, um, but it would be worth contacting legal services you know, either Pine Tree or Legal Services for the Elderly or the Volunteer Lawyers Project um, to try to get um, some legal representation. Because although occasionally um, debtors do defend these suits successfully, there are a hundred pitfalls. And it's a very difficult thing to na navigate on your own. Often summons and complaint, complaint cases are resolved simply through paperwork through the failure to answer something that needs to be answered or to file an opposing motion or to oppose a motion for summary judgment, which is essentially a paper trial. If the defendant, you know, the individual debtor, the defendant is successful in avoiding all the pit files, there will eventually be a hearing. And the hearing is somewhat similar um, to the small claims hearing. It's in a district court, it, but it is a more formal process and the rules of evidence do apply. So it's important to understand exactly how the information can be provided to the judge. Again, not impossible for a person to do on their own, but legal representation is, would be extremely helpful. If a creditor 
is successful in getting a judgment against a debtor. That's essentially a statement from the state of Maine that the debtor owes the creditor X dollars. You know, they're money judgments. They're for $2,000 or $2,300 or $50,000. They're for a set certain amount of money. The court rules expect that payment will be made within 30 days. I believe it's 30. Um, if payment is not made within that time period, there are other ways that the person who holds the judgment, the creditor, can force payment. The first step in most cases is disclosure. It's when the creditor can force the debtor to come into court, explain their finances, essentially testify under oath about their finances to see if they have the ability to pay the debt. There are also, in certain circumstances, creditors can get a order to withhold that would have wage garnishment um, for wages that are paid. There, theoretically, it's also possible to get an order of turnover or sale for assets that the creditor might have, um, sorry, assets that the debtor might have um, that aren't protected by Maine law. That is not a common procedure for most unsecured creditors to use, but it does exist out there and it's something to be concerned about. This leads me into the next topic, which is also tied directly to knowing the worst thing that can happen, and that is the idea of exemptions. Maine law protects, in theory, basic income and, and um, assets that are necessary to keep body and soul together. Maine, eliminate, Maine eliminated debtor's prison a long time ago, and our laws are structured in such a way that even a person who has been found to owe money should be able to maintain a basic standard of living that provides for a certain level of dignity and well-being. The primary exemptions that most people can claim are for primary residents, which for any non-elderly, non-disabled person is $47,500 under current law for their equity in the house. And by equity, I mean the fair market value of the house, essentially what you'd price it at if you wanted to sell it within six months in the place where you live, and the mortgage that's still out against it. So if you have a $150,000 house, you owe $120,000 on it, your equity in that house is $30,000. So it would be within the exemption amount. The exemption amount is for your interest in the property. If there's multiple owners, there could be multiple exemptions. Um, and in any case, when you look at the value of the property, you look at the value of your interest, not the interest as a whole. So if two people own a house, you would essentially divide a lot of those numbers in half to figure out what the equity was. You know, $150,000 house, $120,000 mortgage. Um, it's very likely that the individual debtor's equity in the house is 15000 which would be, again, would be under the exemption amount. There are also protections for cars, $5,000 of equity under Maine law. There are, there's about two pages of more complex exemptions that are, that they reflect the fact that it's an old statute. There's for certain amounts of coal, certain amounts of tractors, livestock, fishing boats, logging equipment, um, household items, um, wedding rings. I mean, there are, it's a very detailed statute, um, but a lot of basic things that are necessary to keep body and soul together are protected. Basic income is protected as well. So social security benefits, either for disability, supplemental security income, or social security retirement are protected from creditors' claims. Essentially, that means that a judge will not force you to make payments out of that income if that is your only income. Certain amounts of wage income are also protected. Um, the shorthand is 40 times the current minimum wage. I think it's roughly, because um, I think it references federal minimum wage, so I think it's about 290 now um, a week, and that's before taxes is protected. Some pensions are protected, unemployment benefits are protected, 
it gets detailed. Um, and again, you know, everyone's circumstances will vary a bit. Um, but it's important to know this concept that there are some protections. You know, even if you find yourself in court, even if you find yourself in a disclosure, there are protections under Maine law, and it's worthwhile doing a little bit of research to find them. On the Help, Help Me Law website, there is a piece of information, I think, called the um, Debt Collection Process in Maine Courts. Um, that's a relatively long a publication. I think it's like 20 pages or so. But it gives a very good plain language explanation of the exemptions, um, which is really important to know, just again, in understanding the situation that you're in. There are other types of debt that the collection can occur without going directly through the court process. Certain types of tax debt, child support debt, um, and debt that's a result of the default on federally guaranteed student loans. And some VA defaults, if a person defaulted on a VA mortgage. And there may be a few minor categories that I'm not mentioning. But for these types of debt, it's essentially possible for the creditor to use a end run around the court system or use an administrative process, I think would be a more fair way of saying it, um, so that they may be able to attach wages or take other action um, directly. But for most creditors, the only way that they can truly force payment is through the court process and through obtaining a judgment and then going through the disclosure and the other processes after judgment um, to force action.